Chapter Six, Part Two of Mount Royal, Volume Three by Mary Elizabeth Braden. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Six, I will have no mercy on him. Part Two. Leonard spent half an hour with his son. The child had escaped from babyhood in the year that had gone. He was now a bright, sentient creature, eager to express his thoughts, to gather knowledge, an active, vivacious being, full of health and energy whatever duties christabel had neglected during her husband's absence the boy had at least suffered no neglect never had childhood developed under happier conditions the father could find no fault in the nursery though there was a vague feeling in his mind that everything was wrong at mount royal why the deuce did she fill the house with people while i was away he muttered to himself in the solitude of his dressing-room where his clothes had been put ready for him and candles lighted by his swiss valet the dressing-room was at the end of the corridor most remote from christabel's apartments it communicated with the room leonard had slept in during his boyhood and that opened again into his gun-room the fact that these rooms had been prepared for him told him plainly enough that he and his wife were henceforth to lead divided lives the event of last october his year of absence had built up a wall between them which he for the time being at least felt himself powerless to knock down can she suspect can she know he asked himself pausing in his dressing to stand staring at the fire with moody brow and troubled eyes no that's hardly possible and yet her whole manner is changed she holds me at a distance every look every tone just now was a defiance of course i know that she loved that man loved him first last always never caring a straw for me she was too careful of herself had been brought up too well to go wrong like other women but she loved him i would never have brought him inside these doors if i had not known that she would take care of herself i tested and tried her to the uttermost and well i took my change out of him mr tregonell dressed himself a little more carefully than he was wont to dress thinking for the most part that anything which suited him was good enough for his friends and went down to the drawing-room feeling like a visitor in a strange house half inclined to wonder how he would be received by his wife and his wife's guests he who had always ruled supreme in that house choosing his visitors for his own pleasure subjugating all tastes and habits of other people to his own convenience now felt as if he were only there on sufferance it was early when he entered the drawing-room and the baron de cazalet was the only occupant of that apartment he was standing in a lounging attitude with his back against the mantelpiece and his handsome person set off by evening dress that regulation costume does not afford much scope to the latent love of finery which still lurks in the civilized man as if to prove his near relationship to the bead and feather-wearing savage but de cazalet had made himself as gorgeous as he could with jewelled studs embroidered shirt satin under waistcoat amber silk stockings and queen and shoes he was assuredly handsome but he had just that style of beauty which to the fastidious mind is more revolting than positive ugliness dark brown eyes strongly arched eyebrows an aquiline nose a sensual mouth a heavy jaw a faultless complexion of the french plum-box order large regular teeth of glittering whiteness a small delicately trained moustache with waxed ends and hair of oily sheen odorous of pomade divine made up the catalogue of his charms leonard stood looking at him doubtfully as if he were a hitherto unknown animal where did my wife pick him up and why he asked himself i should have thought he was just the kind of man she would detest how glad you must be to get back to your larrys and panatis said the baron smiling blandly i'm uncommonly glad to get back to my horses and dogs answered leonard flinging himself into a large armchair by the fire and taking up a newspaper have you been long in the west about a fortnight but i have been only three days at mount royal i had the honour to renew my acquaintance with mrs tregonell last august at zermatt and she was good enough to say that if ever i found myself in this part of the country she would be pleased to receive me in her house i needn't tell you that with such a temptation in view i was very glad to bend my steps westward i spent ten days on board a friend's yacht between dartmouth and the lizard landed at penzance last tuesday and posted here where i received a more than hospitable welcome you are a great traveller i understand i doubt if i have done as much as you have in that way i have seldom travelled for the sake of travelling i have lived in the tents of the arabs i have bivouacked on the pampas 
and enjoyed life in all the cities of the south from valparaiso to cartagena but i can boast no mountaineering exploits or scientific discoveries and i never read a paper at the geographical you look a little too fond of yourself for mountaineering said leonard smiling grimly at the baron's portly figure and all-pervading sleekness well yes i like a wild life but i have no relish for absolute hardship the thermometer below zero a doubtful supply of provisions pemmican roasted skunk for supper without any currant jelly ah no i love my knees at mine inn he threw out his fine expanse of padded chest and shoulders and surveyed the spacious lamp-lit room with an approving smile this no doubt was the kind of inn at which he loved to take his ease a house full of silly women ready to be subjugated by his florid good looks and shallow accomplishments the ladies now came straggling in first emily st aubin and then dopsy whose attempts at conversation were coldly received by the county maiden dopsy and mopsy's home-made gowns cheap laces and frillings and easy flippancy were not agreeable to the st aubin sisters it was not that the st aubin manners which always savoured of the stable and farmyard were more refined or elegant but the st aubins arrogated to themselves the right to be vulgar and resented free and easy manners in two young persons who were obviously poor and obviously obscure as to their surroundings if their gowns had been made by a west end tailor and they had been able to boast of intimate acquaintance with a duchess and two or three countesses their flippancy might have been tolerable nay even amusing to the two miss st aubins but girls who went nowhere and knew nobody had no right to attempt smartness of speech and deserved to be sat upon to dopsy succeeded mopsy then some men then mrs st aubin and her younger sister clara then mrs tregonell in a red gown draped with old spanish lace and with diamond stars in her hair a style curiously different from those quiet dinner dresses she had been wont to wear a year ago leonard looked at her in blank amazement just as he had looked at their first meeting she who had been like the violet sheltering itself among its leaves now obviously dressed for effect in as obviously courted admiration the dinner was cheerful to riotousness everybody had something to say anecdotes were told and laughter was frequent and loud the st aubin girls who had deliberately snubbed the sisters vandeleur were not above conversing with the brother and finding him a kindred spirit in horsiness and dogginess took him at once into their confidence and were on the friendliest terms before dinner was finished de cazalet sat next his hostess and talked exclusively to her mr fitzjesse had miss bridgeman on his left hand and conversed with her in gentle murmurs save when in his quiet voice and with his seeming innocent smile he told some irresistibly funny story some touch of character seen with a philosophic eye for the general joy of the whole table very different was the banquet of to-day from that quiet dinner on the first night of mr hamley's visit to mount royal that dinner at which leonard watched his wife so intensely eager to discover to what degree she was affected by the presence of her first lover he watched her to-night at the head of her brilliantly lighted dinner-table no longer the old subdued light of low-shaded lamps but the radiance of innumerable candles in lofty silver candelabra shining over a striking decoration of vivid crimson asters and spreading palm-leaves he watched her helplessly hopelessly knowing that he and she were ever so much farther apart than they had been in the days before he brought angus hamley to mount royal those miserable discontented days when he had fretted himself into a fever of jealousy and vague suspicion and had thought to find a cure by bringing the man he feared and hated into his home so that he might know for certain how deep the wrong was which this man's very existence seemed to inflict upon him to bring those two who had loved and parted face to face to watch and listen to fathom the thoughts of each that had been the process natural and congenial to his jealous temper but the result had been an uncomfortable one and now he saw his wife whose heart he had tried to break hating her because he had failed to make her love him just as remote and unapproachable as of old what a fool i was to marry her he thought after replying somewhat at random to mrs st aubin's last remark upon the superiority of dorkings to spaniards from a culinary point of view it was my determination to have my own way that wrecked me i couldn't submit to be conquered by a girl to have the wife i had set my heart upon when i was a boy stolen from me by the first effeminate foppling my silly mother invited to mount royal i had never imagined myself with any other woman for my wife never really cared for any other woman 
this was the bent of mr tregonell's reflections as he sat in his place at that animated assembly adding nothing to its mirth or even to its noise albeit in the past his voice had ever been loudest his laugh most resonant he felt more at his ease after dinner when the woman had left the brilliant de cazalet slipping away soon after them although not until he had finished his host's la rose and when mr st aubin expanded himself in county talk enlightening the wanderer as to the progress of events during his absence while mr fitz jesse sat blandly puffing his cigarette a silent observer of the speech and gestures of the county magnate speculating from a scientific point of view as to how much of this talk was purely automatic an inane drivel which would go on just the same if half the squire's brain had been scooped out jack vandeleur smoked and drank brandy and water while little monty discoursed to him in confidential tones upon the racing year which was now expiring at newmarket the men who had made pots of money and the men who had been beggared for life there seemed to be no medium between those extremes when the host rose captain vandeleur was for an immediate adjournment to billiards but to his surprise leonard walked off to the drawing-room aren't you coming asked jack dejectedly not to-night i have been too long away from feminine society not to appreciate the novelty of an evening with ladies you and monty can have the table to yourselves unless mr fitz jesse i never play replied the gentle journalist but i rather like sitting in a billiard-room and listening to the conversation of the players it is always so full of ideas captain vandeleur and mr montague went their way and the other men repaired to the drawing-room whence came the sound of the piano and the music of a rich baritone trolling out a popular air from the most fashionable opera bouffe that one piece which all paris was bent upon hearing at the same moment whereby seats in the little boulevard theatre were selling at a ridiculous premium de cazalet was singing to mrs tregonell's accompaniment a patois song with a refrain which would have been distinctly indecent if the tails of all the words had not been clipped off so as to reduce the language to mild idiocy the kind of song one could fancy being fashionable in the decline of the roman empire said fitz jesse when apuleius was writing his golden ass don't you know after the song came a duet from traviata in which christabel sang with a dramatic power which leonard never remembered to have heard from her before the two voices harmonized admirably and there were warm expressions of delight from the listeners very accomplished man de cazalet said colonel blathwaite uncommonly useful in a country house sings and plays and recites and acts rather puffy and short-winded in his elocution if he were a horse one would call him a roarer but always ready to amuse quite an acquisition who is he asked leonard looking glum my wife picked him up in switzerland i hear that is to say he seems to have made himself agreeable or useful to mrs tregonell and miss bridgman and in a moment of ill-advised hospitality my wife asked him here is he received anywhere does anybody know anything about him he is received in a few houses rich houses where the hostess goes in for amateur acting and tableaux vivants don't you know and people know a good deal about him nothing actually to his detriment the man was a full-blown adventurer when he had the good luck to get hold of a rich wife he pays his way now i believe but the air of the adventurer hangs round him still a man of irish parentage brought up in jersey what can you expect of him does he drink like a fish but his capacity to drink is only to be estimated by cubic space the amount he can hold his brain and constitution have been educated up to alcohol nothing can touch him further colonel blathwaite we want you to give us the wonderful one-horse shay and after that the baron is going to recite james lee's wife said mrs tregonell while her guests ranged themselves into an irregular semicircle and the useful miss bridgman placed a prix dieu chair in a commanding position for the reciter to lean upon gracefully or hug convulsively in the more energetic passages of his recitation everybody seems to have gone mad thought mr tregonell as he seated himself and surveyed the assembly all intent and expectant his wife sat near the piano with de cazalet bending over her talking in just that slightly lowered voice which gives an idea of confidential relations yet may mean no more than a vain man's desire to appear the accepted worshipper of a beautiful woman 
never had leonard seen angus hamley's manner so distinctively attentive as was the air of this hibernian adventurer just the last man whose attentions i should have supposed she would tolerate thought leonard but any garbage is food for a woman's vanity the wonderful one-horse chay was received with laughter and delight dopsy and mopsy were in raptures how could a horrid american have written anything so clever but then it was colonel blathwaite's inimitable elocution which gave a charm to the whole thing the poem was poor enough no doubt if one read it to oneself colonel blathwaite was adorably funny it's a tremendous joke as you do it said mopsy twirling her sunflower fan a great yellow flower like the sign of the sun inn on a black satin ground how delightful to be so gifted now for james lee's wife said the colonel who accepted the damsel's compliments for what they were worth you'll have to be very attentive if you want to find out what the poem means for the baron's delivery is a trifle spasmodic and now de cazalet stepped forward with a vellum bound volume in his hand dashed back his long sleek hair with a large white hand glanced at the page coughed faintly and then began in thick hurried accents which kept getting thicker and more hurried as the poem advanced it was given not in lines but in spasms panted out till at the close the baron sank exhausted breathless like the hunted deer when the hounds close round him beautiful exquisite too pathetic exclaimed a chorus of feminine voices i only wish the browning society could hear that they would be delighted said mr faddy who piqued himself upon being in the literary world it makes browning so much easier to understand remarked mr fitzjesse with his habitual placidity brings the whole thing home to you makes it ever so much more real don't you know said mrs torrington poor james lee sighed mopsy poor mrs lee ejaculated dopsy did he die asked miss st aubyn did she run away from him inquired her sister the railroad pace at which the baron fired off the verses having left all those among his hearers who did not know the text in a state of agreeable uncertainty so the night wore on with more songs and duets from opera and opera bouffe no more of beethoven's grand bursts of melody now touched with the solemnity of religious feeling now melting in human pathos now light and airy changeful and capricious as the skylark's song a very fountain of joyous fancies mr tregonell had never appreciated beethoven being indeed as unmusical a soul as god ever created but he thought it a more respectable thing that his wife should sit at her piano playing an order of music which only the privileged few could understand than that she would delight the common herd by singing which savoured of music-hall and burlesque is she not absolutely delicious said mrs torrington beating time with her fan how proud i should be of myself if i could sing like that how proud you must be of your wife such verve such elan so thoroughly in the spirit of the thing that is the only kind of singing anybody really cares for now one goes to the opera to hear them scream through lohengrin or tannhauser and then one goes into society and talks about wagner but it is music like this one enjoys yes it's rather jolly said leonard staring moodily at his wife in the act of singing a refrain of b b b which was supposed to represent the bleating of an innocent lamb and the baron's voice goes so admirably with mrs tregonell's yes his voice goes admirably said leonard sorely tempted to blaspheme weren't you charmed to find us all so gay and bright here nothing to suggest the sad break-up you had last year i felt so intensely sorry for you all yet i was selfish enough to be glad i had left before it happened did they don't think me morbid for asking did they bring him home here yes they brought him home and in which room did they put him one always wants to know these things though it can do one no good in the blue room the second from the end of the corridor next but one to mine that's rather awfully near do you believe in spiritual influences have you ever had a revelation good gracious is it really so late everybody seems to be going let me get your candle said leonard eagerly making a dash for the hall and so ended his first evening at home with that imbecile refrain bay 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 repeating itself in his ears <laughs>
End of chapter 6「Chapter Seven of Mount Royal, Volume Three by Mary Elizabeth Braden. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Seven Guy donc la voyageuse au cou du pèlerin. When Mr. Tregonell came to the breakfast room next morning, he found everybody alert with the stir and expectation of an agreeable day. The Trevena Harriers were to meet for the first time this season, and everybody was full of that event. Christabel, Mrs. Torrington, and the St. Aubin girls were breakfasting in their habits and hats. Whips and gloves were lying about on chairs and side tables. Everybody was talking, and everybody seemed in a hurry. De Cazalet looked gorgeous in olive corduroy and new market boots. Mr. St. Aubin looked businesslike in a well-worn red coat and mahogany tops, while the other men inclined to dark shooting jackets, buckskins, and napoleons mr fitzjesse in a morning suit that savoured of the study rather than the hunting field contemplated these nimrods with an amused smile but the rev st bernard beheld them not without pangs of envy he too had been in arcadia he too had followed the hounds in his green oxford days before he joined that band of young anglicans who he doubted not would be by and by as widely renowned as the heroes of the tractarian movement who are you going to meet inquired leonard as his wife handed him his coffee do you think i would take the trouble to put on my habit in order to ride from here to trevena exclaimed christabel i am going with the rest of them of course emily st aubin will show me the way but you have never hunted because your dear mother was too nervous to allow me but i have ridden over every inch of the ground i know my horse and my horse knows me you needn't be afraid mrs tregonell is one of the finest horsewomen i ever saw said the Cazalet it is a delight to ride by her side are you not coming with us he asked yes i'll ride after you said leonard i forgot all about the harriers nobody told me they were to begin work this morning the horses were brought round to the porch the ladies put on their gloves and adjusted themselves in those skimpy lop-sided petticoats which have replaced the flowing drapery of the dark ages when a horsewoman's legs and boots were in some wise a mystery to the outside world leonard went out to look at the horses a strange horse would have interested him even on his deathbed while one ray of consciousness yet remained to recognize the degrees of equine strength and quality he overhauled the mare which major brie had chosen for christabel a month ago a magnificent three-quarter bred hunter full of power do you think she can carry me asked christabel she could carry a house yes you ought to be safe upon her is that big black brute the baron's horse yes i thought so so a coarse clumsy beast all show muttered leonard like master like man he turned away to examine colonel blathwaite's hunter a good-looking chestnut and in that moment the baron had taken up his ground by christabel's mare and was ready to lift her into the saddle she went up as lightly as a shuttlecock from a battledore scarcely touching the corduroy shoulder but leonard felt angry with the baron for usurping a function which should have been left for the husband is betsy baker in condition he asked the head groom as the party rode away de cazalet on mrs tregonell's right hand splendid sir she only wants work get her ready as quick as you can i'll take it out of her mr tregonell kept his word wherever de cazalet and christabel rode that day christabel's husband went with them the baron was a bold bad rider reckless of himself brutal to his horse christabel rode superbly and was superbly mounted those hills which seemed murderous to the stranger were as nothing to her she had galloped up and down them on her shetland pony and had seldom ridden over better ground from the time when major brie first took her out with the leading rein the day was long and there was plenty of fast going but these three were always in the front yet even the husband's immediate neighbourhood in no wise lessened the baron's marked attention to the wife and leonard rode homeward at dusk sorely troubled in spirit what did it mean could it be that she whose conduct last year had seemed without reproach who had borne herself with matronly dignity with virginal purity towards the lover of her girlhood the refined and accomplished angus hamley could it be that she had allowed herself to be involved in a flirtation with such a tinsel dandy as this de cazalet it would be sheer lunacy he said to himself perhaps she is carrying on like this to annoy me punishing me for 
he rode home a little way behind those other two full of vexation and bewilderment nothing had happened of which he could reasonably complain he could scarcely kick this man out of his house because he inclined his head at a certain angle because he dropped his voice to a lower key when he spoke to christabel yet his very attitude in the saddle as he rode on ahead his hand on his horse's flank his figure turned towards christabel was a provocation opera bouffe duets recitations acted charades bout rimé all the catalogue of grown-up playfulness began again after dinner but this evening leonard did not stay in the drawing-room he felt that he could not trust himself his disgust must needs explode into some rudeness of speech if he remained to witness these vagaries i like the society of barmaids and i can tolerate the company of ladies he said to his bosom friend jack but a mixture of the two is unendurable so we'll have a good smoke and half crown pool shilling lives this was as much as to say that leonard and his other friends were about to render their half crowns and shillings as tribute to captain vandeleur's superior play that gentleman having made pool his profession since he left the army they played till midnight in an atmosphere which grew thick with tobacco smoke before the night was done they played till jack vandeleur's pockets were full of loose silver until the other men had come to the conclusion that pool was a slow game with an element of childishness in it at the best no real skill only a mere mechanical knack acquired by incessant practice in fusty public rooms reeking with alcohol show me a man who plays like that and i'll show you a scamp muttered little monty in a friendly aside to leonard as jack vandeleur swept up the last pool i know he's a scamp answered leonard but he's a pleasant scamp and a capital fellow to travel with never ill never out of temper always ready for the day's work whatever it is and always able to make the best of things why don't you marry one of his sisters they're both jolly good fellows no coin said monty shaking his neat little flaxen head i can just contrive to keep myself still to be neat still to be dressed what in mercy's name should i do with a wife who would want food and gowns and stalls at the theatres i have been thinking that if those st alban girls have money on the nail you know not in the form of expectations from that painfully healthy father i might think seriously of one of them they are horridly rustic smell of clover and beans and would be likely to disgrace one in london society but they are not hideous i don't think there's much ready money in that quarter monty answered leonard st aubin has a good deal of land land screamed monty i wouldn't touch it with a pair of tongs the workhouses of the next century will be peopled by the offspring of the landed gentry i shudder when i think of the country squire and his prospects hard lines said jack who had made that remark two or three times before in the course of the evening they were sitting round the fire by this time smoking and drinking mulled burgundy and the conversation had become general this night was as many other nights sometimes mr tregonell tried to live through the evening in the drawing-room enduring the society games the boulevard music the recitations and tableau and general frivolity but he found these amusements hang upon his spirits like a nightmare he watched his wife but could discover nothing actually reprehensible in her conduct nothing upon which he could take his stand as an outraged husband and say this shall not be if the baron's devotion to her was marked enough for every one to see and if her acceptance of his attentions was gracious in the extreme his devotion and her graciousness were no more than he had seen everywhere accepted as a small change of society meaning nothing tending towards nothing but gradual satiety except in those few exceptional cases which ended in open scandal and took society by surprise that which impressed leonard was the utter change in his wife's character it seemed as if her very nature were altered womanly tenderness a gentle and subdued manner had given place to a hard brilliancy it was as if he had lost a pearl and found a diamond in its place one of all softness and purity the other all sparkle and light he was too proud to sue her for any renewal of old confidences to claim from her any of the duties of a wife if she could live and be happy without him and he knew but too surely that his presence his affection had never contributed to her happiness he would let her see that he could live without her that he was content to accept the position she had chosen union which was no union marriage that had ceased to be marriage 
a chain drawn out to its furthest length yet held so lightly that neither need feel the bondage everybody at mount royal was loud in praise of christabel she was so brilliant so versatile she made her house so utterly charming this was the verdict of her new friends but her old friends were less enthusiastic major brie came to the manor house very seldom now and frankly owned himself a fish out of water in mrs tregonell's new circle everybody is so laboriously lively he said there is an air of forced hilarity i sigh for the house as it was in your mother's time leonard a haunt of ancient peace there's not much peace about it now by jove said leonard why did you put it into my wife's head to ride to hounds i had nothing to do with it she asked me to choose her a hunter and i chose her something good and safe that's all but i don't think you ought to object to her hunting leonard or to her doing anything else that may help to keep her in good spirits she was in a very bad way all the winter do you mean that she was seriously ill their letters to me were so d blank short i hardly know anything that went on while i was away yes she was very ill given over to melancholy it was only natural that she should be affected by angus hamley's death when you remember what they had been to each other before you came home a woman may break an engagement of that kind and may be very happy in her union with another man but she can't forget her first lover if it were only because he is the first it was an unlucky thing your bringing him to mount royal one of your impulsive follies yes one of my follies so you say that christabel was out of health and spirits all the winter yes she would see no one not even me or the rector no one but the doctor ever crossed the threshold but surely miss bridgman has told you all about it miss bridgman was devoted to her miss bridgman is as close as the grave and i am not going to demean myself by questioning her well there is no need to be unhappy about the past christabel is herself again thank god brighter prettier than ever that swiss tour with miss bridgman and the boy did her worlds of good i thought you made a mistake in leaving her at mount royal after that melancholy event you should have taken her with you perhaps i ought to have done so assented leonard thinking how bitterly how very improbable it was that she would have consented to go with him he tried to make the best of his position painful as it was he blustered and hectored as of old gave his days to field sports his evenings for the most part to billiards and tobacco he drank more than he had been accustomed to drink sat up late of nights his nerves were not benefited by these latter habits your hand is as shaky as an old woman's exclaimed jack upon his opponent missing an easy cannon why you might have done that with a boot jack if you're not careful you'll be in for an attack of deltrem and that will chaw you up in a very short time a man of your stamina is the worst kind of subject for nervous diseases we shall have you catching flies and seeing imaginary snowstorms before long leonard received this friendly warning with a scornful laugh de cazalet drinks more brandy in a day than i do in a week he said ah but look at his advantages brought up in jersey where cognac is duty free none of us have had his fine training wonderful constitution he must have and as steady as a rock you saw him this morning knock off a particular acorn from the oak in the stable yard with a bullet yes the fellow can shoot he's less of an impostor than i expected wonderful eye and hand he must have spent years of his life in a shooting gallery you're a deuced good shot tregonell but compared with him you're not in it that's very likely though i have had to live by my gun in the rockies fitz jesse told me that in south america de cazalet was known as a professed duelist and you have only shot four-footed beasts never gone for a fellow creature answered jack lightly End of chapter seven chapter eight of mount royal volume three by mary elizabeth braden this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eight time turns the old days to derision if leonard tregonell was troubled and perplexed by the change in his wife's character there was one other person at mount royal christabel's nearest and dearest friend to whom that change was even a greater mystification 
jessie bridgman who had been with her in the dark hours of her grief who had seen her sunk in the apathy of despair who had comforted and watched her and sympathized and wept with her looked on now in blank wonderment at a phase of character which was altogether enigmatical she had been with mrs tregonell at Cermat when de cazalet had obtruded himself on their notice by his officious attentions during a pilgrimage to rifle and she had been bewildered at christabel's civility to a man of such obvious bad style he had stayed at the same hotel with them for three or four days and had given them as much of his society as he could without being absolutely intrusive taking advantage of having met christabel five seasons ago at two or three quasi literary assemblies and at parting christabel had invited him to mount royal mr tregonell will be at home in the autumn she said and if you should find yourself in cornwall he had talked of exploring the west of england i know he would be glad to see you at mount royal when jessie hinted at the unwisdom of an invitation to a man of whom they knew so little christabel answered carelessly that leonard liked to have his house full of lively people and he would no doubt be pleased with the baron de cazalet you used to leave him to choose his own visitors i know but i mean to take a more active part in the arrangement of things in future i am tired of being a cipher did you hear those people talking of the baron at table d'hote yesterday i heard a little i was not particularly attentive then perhaps you did not hear that he is a thorough bohemian that he led a very wild life in south america and was a notorious duellist what can that matter to us even if it is true it seemed to jessie that christabel's whole nature underwent a change and that the transformation dated from her acquaintance with this man they were at the end of their tour at the time of this meeting and they came straight through to paris where mrs tregonell abandoned herself to frivolity going to all the theatres buying all the newest and lightest music spending long mornings with milliners and dressmakers squandering money upon fine clothes which a year ago she would have scorned to wear hitherto her taste had tended to simplicity of attire not without richness for she was too much of an artist not to value the artistic effects of costly fabrics the beauty of warm colouring but she now pursued that will-o'-the-wisp fashion from worth to Penga, and bought any number of gowns some of which to miss bridgman's severe taste seemed simply odious do you intend spending next season in mayfair and do you expect to be asked to a good many fancy balls asked jessie as mrs tregonell's maid exhibited the gowns in the spacious bedroom at the bristol nonsense jessie these are all dinner gowns the infinite variety of modern fashion is its chief merit the style of to-day embraces three centuries of the past from catherine de medici to madame Ricamier. at one of the boulevard theatres mrs tregonell and miss bridgman met mr fitzjessie who was also returning from a summer holiday he was angus hamley's friend and had known christabel during the happy days of her first london season it seemed hardly strange that she should be glad to meet him and that she should ask him to mount royal and now i must have some women to meet these men she said when she and jessie were at home again and the travelled infant had gone back to his nursery and had inquired why the hills he saw from his windows were no longer white and why the sea was so much bigger than the lakes he had seen lately i mean to make the house as pleasant as possible for leonard when he comes home she and jessie were alone in the oak-panelled parlour the room with the alcove overlooking the hills and the sea they were seated at a little table in this recess christabel's desk open before her jessie knitting how gaily you speak have you she was going to say have you forgiven him for what was done at st necton's kiev but she checked herself when the words were on her lips what if leonard's crime was not forgiven but forgotten in that long dreary winter they had never spoken of the manner of angus hamley's death christabel's despair had been silent jessie had comforted her with vague words which never touched upon the cruel details of her grief how if the mind had been affected by that long interval of sorrow and the memory of leonard's deed blotted out christabel's new delight in frivolous things her sudden fancy for filling her house with lively people might be the awakening of a new life of vigour in a mind that had trembled on the confines of madness was it for her to recall bitter facts to reopen the fountain of tears she gave one little sigh for the untimely dead and then addressed herself to the duty of pleasing christabel just as in days gone by her every effort had been devoted to making the elder mrs tregonell happy i suppose you had better ask mrs fairfax storrington she suggested yes leonard and she are great chums 
we must have mrs torrington and there are the st aubins nice lively girls and an inoffensive father and mother i believe leonard rather likes them and then it will be a charity to have dopsy and mopsy i thought you detested them no poor foolish things i was once sorry for dopsy the tears rushed to her eyes she rose suddenly from her chair and went to the window then she has not forgotten thought jessie so it was that the autumn party was planned mr faddie was doing duty at the little church in the glen and thus happened to be in the way of an invitation mr montague was asked as a person of general usefulness the st aubin party brought horses and men and maids and contributed much to the liveliness of the establishment so far as noise means gaiety they were all assembled when baron de cazalet telegraphed from a yacht off the lizard to ask if he might come and receiving a favourable reply landed at penzance and posted over with his valet his horse and gun cases were brought from london by another servant leonard had been home nearly a fortnight and had begun to accept this new mode of life without further wonder and to fall into his old ways and find some degree of pleasure in his old occupations hunting shooting the vandeleur girls were draining the cup of pleasure to the dregs dopsy forgot her failure and grief of last year one cannot waste all one's life in mourning for a lover who was never in love with one i wore bugles for him all last winter and if i had been able to buy a new black gown i would have kept in mourning for six months she told her sister apologetically as if ashamed of her good spirits but i can't help enjoying myself in such a house as this is not mrs tregonell changed for the better everything's changed for the better assented mopsy if we had only horses and could hunt like those stuck-up st aubin girls life would be perfect they ride well i suppose said dopsy but they are dreadfully arriere they haven't an aesthetic idea when i told them we had thoughts of belonging to the browning society that eldest one asked me if it was like the birkbeck and if we should be able to buy a house rent free by monthly instalments and the youngest said that sunflowers were only fit for cottage gardens and the narrow-minded mother declared she could see no beauty in single dahlias added dopsy with ineffable disgust the day was hopelessly wet and the visitors at mount royal were spending the morning in that somewhat straggling manner common to people who are in somebody else's house impressed with a feeling that it is useless to settle oneself even to the interesting labour of art needlework when one is not by one's own fireside the sportsmen were all out but de cazalet the rev st bernard and mr fitzjesse preferred the shelter of a well-warmed jacobian mansion to the wild sweep of the wind across the moor or the dash of the billows i have had plenty of wild life on the shores of the pacific said de cazalet luxuriating in a large sage green plush armchair one of the anachronisms of the grave old library at home i revel in civilization i cannot have too much of warmth and comfort velvety nests like this to lounge in downy cushions to lean against hot-house flowers and french cookery delicious to hear the rain beating against the glass and the wind howling in the chimney put another log on fatty like the best of fellows the rev st bernard not much appreciating this familiarity daintily picked a log from the big brazen basket and dropped it in a gingerly manner upon the hearth carefully dusting his fingers afterwards with a cambric handkerchief which sent forth odours of marechal mr fitzjesse was sitting at a distant table with a large despatch box and a pile of open letters before him writing at railway speed in order to be in time for the one o'clock post he is making up his paper said de cazalet lazily contemplating the worker's bowed shoulders i wonder if he is saying anything about us i am happy to say that he does not often discuss church matters said mr faddie he shows his good sense by a careful avoidance of opinion upon our difficulties and our differences perhaps he doesn't think them worth discussing of no more consequence than the shades of difference between tweedledum and tweedledee yawned de cazalet whereupon mr faddie gave him a look of contemptuous anger and left the room mr fitzjesse went away soon afterwards with his batch of letters for the post-bag in the hall and the baron was left alone in listless contemplation of the fire he had been in the drawing-room but had found that apartment uninteresting by reason of mrs tregonell's absence he did not care to sit and watch the two miss st aubins playing chess nor to hear mrs fairfax torrington dribbling out stray paragraphs from the society journals for the benefit of nobody in particular 
nor to listen to mrs st aubyn's disquisitions upon the merits of alderney cows with which jessie bridgman made believe to be interested while deep in the intricacies of a cruel work daffodil for him the spacious pink and white panelled room without one particular person was more desolate than the wild expanse of the pampas with its low undulations growing rougher towards the base of the mountains he had come to the library an apartment chiefly used by the men to bask in the light of the fire and to brood upon agreeable thoughts the meditations of a man who has a very high opinion of his own merits are generally pleasant and just now oliver de cazalet's ideas about himself were unusually exalted for had he not obviously made the conquest of one of the most charming women he had ever met a pity she has a husband he thought it would have suited me remarkably well to drop into such a luxurious nest as this the boy is not three years old by the time he came of age well i should have lived my life i suppose and could afford to subside into comfortable obscurity sighed the cazalet conscious of his forty years the husband looks uncommonly tough but even hercules was mortal one never knows how or when a man of that stamp may go off the hooks these pleasing reflections were disturbed by the entrance of mopsy who after prowling all over the house in a quest of masculine society came yawning into the library in search of anything readable in the way of a newspaper a readable paper with mopsy meaning theatres fashions or scandal she gave a little start at sight of de cazalet whose stalwart form and florid good looks were by no means obnoxious to her taste if he had not been so evidently devoted to mrs tregonell mopsy would have perchance essayed his subjugation but remembering dopsy's bitter experience of last year the sadder and wiser miss vandeleur had made up her mind not to go for any marriageable man in too distinct a manner she would play that fluking game which she most affected at billiards sending her ball spinning all over the table with the hope that some successful result must come of a vigorous stroke she fluttered about the room then stopped in a fra angelico pose over a table strewed with papers baron have you seen the queen she asked presently often i had the honour of making my bow to her last april she is one of the dearest women i know and she was good enough to feel interested in my somewhat romantic career how nice but i mean the queen newspaper i am dying to know if it really is coming in now it has been seen in paris i'm afraid it's inevitable may i ask what it is perhaps i oughtn't to mention it crinoline there is a talk about something called a crinolette and uh, crinolette i suppose is own sister to crinoline i'm afraid so don't you hate them i do i love the early italian style clinging cashmere soft flowing draperies and accentuated angles well yes if one has to ride in a hansom or a single brougham with a woman the hoop and powder style is rather a burthen but women are such lovely beings they are adorable in any costume madame tallier with bare feet and no petticoats to speak of pompadour in patches and wide-spreading brocade margaret of orleans in a peaked head-dress and puffed sleeves mary stuart in a black velvet coif and a ruff each and all adorable on a pretty woman on a pretty woman yes the pretty woman set the fashions and the ugly woman have to wear them that's the difficulty ah me sighed the baron did any one ever see an ugly woman there are so many degrees of beauty that it takes a long time to get from venus to her opposite a smile a sparkle a kindly look a fresh complexion a neat bonnet vivacious conversation such trifles will pass for beauty with a man who worships the sex for him every flower in the garden of womanhood from the imperial rose to the lowly buttercup has its own peculiar charm and yet i should have thought you were awfully fastidious said mopsy trifling with the newspapers and that nothing short of absolute perfection would please you absolute perfection is generally a bore i have met famous beauties who had no more attraction than if they had been famous statues yes i know there is a cold kind of beauty but there are women who are as fascinating as they are lovely our hostess for instance don't you think her utterly sweet she is very lovely do come and sit by the fire it is such a creepy morning i'll hunt for any newspapers you like presently but in the meantime let us chat 
i was getting horribly tired of my own thoughts when you came in mopsy simpered and sat down in the easy chair opposite the baron's she began to think that this delightful person admired her more than she had hitherto supposed his desire for her company looked promising what if after all she who had striven so much less eagerly than poor dopsy strove last year should be on the high road to a conquest here was the handsomest man she had ever met a man with title and money courting her society in a house full of people yes she is altogether charming said the baron lazily as if he were talking merely for the sake of conversation very sweet as you say but not quite my style there is something an intangible something wanting she has chic she has savoir faire but she has not no she has not that electrical wit which which i have admired in others less conventionally beautiful the baron's half-veiled smile a smile glancing from under lowered eyelids hinted that this vital spark which was wanting in christabel might be found in mopsy the damsel blushed and looked down conscious of eyelashes artistically treated i don't think mrs tregonell has been quite happy in her married life said mopsy my brother and mr tregonell are very old friends don't you know like brothers in fact and mr tregonell tells jack everything i know his cousin didn't want to marry him she was engaged to somebody else don't you know and that engagement was broken off but he had set his heart upon marrying her and his mother had set her heart upon the match and between them they talked her into it she never really wanted to marry him leonard has owned that to jack in his savage moods but i ought not to run on so i am doing very wrong said mopsy hastily you may say anything you please to me i am like the grave i never give up a secret said the baron who had settled himself comfortably in his chair assured that mopsy once set going would tell him all she could tell no i don't believe from what jack says he says in his tempers i don't believe she ever liked him pursued mopsy and she was desperately in love with the other one but she gave him up at her aunt's instigation because of some early intrigue of his which was absurd as she should have known poor thing if she had not been brought up in this out-of-the-way corner of the world the other one who was the other one asked the baron the man who was shot at the st nectan's give last year you must have heard the story yes mr st aubyn told me about it and this mr hamley had been engaged to mrs tregonell odd that he should be staying in this house wasn't it one of those odd things that leonard tregonell is fond of doing he was always eccentric and during this visit was there anything the best of women are mortal was there anything in the way of a flirtation going on between mrs tregonell and her former sweetheart not a shadow of impropriety answered mopsy heartily she behaved perfectly i knew the story from my brother and couldn't help watching them there was nothing underhand not the faintest indication of a secret understanding between them and mr tregonell was not jealous i cannot say but i am sure he had no cause i suppose mrs tregonell was deeply affected by mr hamley's death i hardly know she seemed wonderfully calm but as we left almost immediately after the accident i had not much opportunity of judging a sad business a lovely woman married to a man she does not care for and really if i were not a visitor under his roof i should be tempted to say that in my opinion no woman in her senses could care for mr tregonell but i suppose after all practical considerations had something to do with the match tregonell is lord of half a dozen manors and the lady hadn't a sixpence was that it not at all mrs tregonell has money in her own right she was the only child of an indian judge and her mother was co-heiress with the late mrs tregonell who was a miss champernown i believe she has at least fifteen hundred a year upon which a single woman might live very comfortably don't you know concluded miss vandeleur with a grand air no doubt said the baron and the fortune was settled on herself i conclude every shilling mr tregonell's mother insisted upon that no doubt she felt it her duty to protect her niece's interest mr tregonell has complained to jack of his wife being so independent it lessens his hold upon her don't you see naturally she is not under any obligation to him for her milliner's bills no and her bills must be awfully heavy this year 
i never saw such a change in any one last autumn she dressed so simply a tailor gown in the morning black velvet or satin in the evening and now there is no end to the variety of her gowns it makes one feel awfully shabby such artistic toilettes as yours can never be shabby said the baron in looking at a picture by greuze one does not think how much a yard the pale indefinite drapery cost one only sees the grace and beauty of the draping true taste will go a long way assented mopsy who had been trying for the last ten years to make taste that is to say a careful study of the west end shop windows do duty for cash then you find mrs tregonell changed since your last visit inquired the cazalet bent upon learning all he could remarkably she is so much livelier she seems so much more anxious to please it is a change altogether for the better she seems gayer brighter happier yes thought the baron she is in love only one magician works such wonders and he is the oldest of the gods the motive power of the universe the gong sounded and they went off to lunch at the foot of the stairs they met christabel bringing down her boy she was not so devoted to him as she had been last year but there were occasions like this wet morning for instance when she gave herself up to his society leo is going to eat his dinner with us she said smiling at the baron if you will not think him a nuisance on the contrary i shall be charmed to improve his acquaintance i hope he will let me sit next to him that lisped leo decisively don't like oo oh leo how rude don't reprove him said the baron it is a comfort to be reminded that for the first three or four years of our lives we all tell the truth but i mean you to like me leo all the same i hate oo said leo frankly he always expressed himself in strong saxon english but oo love my mamma this in a shrill childish treble was awkward for the rest of the party mrs fairfax torrington gave an arch glance at mr fitzjesse dopsy reddened and exploded in a little spluttering laugh behind her napkin christabel looked divinely unconscious smiling down at her boy whose chair had been placed at the corner of the table close to his mother it is a poet's privilege to worship the beautiful leo said the baron with a self-satisfied smirk the old troubadour's right of allegiance to the loveliest as old as chivalry and as disreputable said fitzjesse if i had been one of the knights of old and had found a troubadour sneaking about my premises that troubadour's head should have been through his guitar before he knew where he was or he should have discovered that my idea of a common chord was a halter but in our present age of ultra refinement the social troubadour is a gentleman and the worship of beauty one of the higher forms of culture the baron looked at the journalist suspiciously bold as he was of speech and bearing he never ventured to cross swords with mr fitzjesse he was too much afraid of seeing an article upon his jersey antecedents or his married life in leaded type in the sling happily mr tregonell was not at luncheon upon this particular occasion he had gone out shooting with jack vandeleur and little monty it was supposed to be a great year for woodcock and the squire and his friends had been after the birds in every direction except st necton's kiev he had refused to go there although it was a tradition that the place was a favourite resort of the birds why don't you shoot mrs tregonell asked mrs torrington it is just the one thing that makes life worth living in a country like this where there is no great scope for hunting i should like roaming about the hills but i could never bring myself to hit a bird answered christabel i am too fond of the feathered race i don't know why or what it is but there is something in a bird which appeals intensely to one's pity i have been more sorry than i can say for a dying sparrow and i can never teach myself to remember that birds are such wretchedly cruel and unprincipled creatures in their dealings with one another that they really deserve very little compassion from man except that man has the responsibility of knowing better said mr fitzjesse that infernal cruelty of the animal creation is one of the problems that must perplex the gentle optimist who sums up his religion in a phrase of popes and avows that whatever is is right who looking at the meek meditative countenance of a jersey cow those large stag-like eyes juno's eyes would believe that mrs cow is capable of trampling a sick sister to death nay would look upon the operation as a matter of course a thing to be done for the good of society 
is there not a little moral trampling done by stag-eyed creatures of a higher grade asked mrs torrington let a woman fall down in the mud and there are plenty of her own sex ready to grind her into the mire cows have a coarser more practical way of treating their fallen sisters but the principle is the same don't you know i have always found man the more malignant animal said fitzjesse at her worst a woman generally has a motive for the evil she does some wrong to avenge some petty slight to retaliate a man stabs for the mere pleasure of stabbing with him slander is one of the fine arts depend upon it your crabtree is a more malevolent creature than mrs candour and the candours would not kill reputations that the crabtrees did not admire and applaud the slaughter for my own part i believe that if there were no men in the world women would be almost kind to each other the baron did not enter into this discussion he had no taste for any subject out of his own line which was art and beauty with character or morals he had nothing to do he did not even pretend to listen to the discourse of the others but amused himself with petting leo who sturdily repulsed his endearments when he spoke it was to reply to christabel's last remark if you are fonder of roaming on the hills than of shooting mrs tregonell why should we not organize a rambling party it is not too late for a picnic let us hold ourselves ready for the first bright day perhaps after this deluge we shall have fine weather to-morrow and organize a pilgrimage to tintagel with all the freedom of pedestrians who can choose their own company and are not obliged to sit opposite the person they least care about in the imprisonment of a barouche or a wagonette walking picnics are the only picnics worth having you are a good walker i know mrs tregonell and you mrs torrington you can walk i have no doubt the widow smiled and nodded oh yes i am good for half a dozen miles or so she said wondering whether she possessed a pair of boots in which she could walk most of her boots being made rather with a view to exhibition on a fender stool or on the step of a carriage than to locomotion but i think as i am not quite so young as i was twenty years ago i had better follow you in the pony carriage pony carriage me no pony carriages exclaimed de cazalet ours is to be a walking picnic and nothing else if you like to meet us as we come home you can do so but none but pedestrians shall drink our champagne or eat our salad that salad which i shall have the honour to make for you with my own hands mrs tregonell jessie bridgman looked at christabel to see if any painful memory any thought of that other picnic at tintagel when angus hamley was still a stranger and the world seemed made for gladness and laughter would disturb her smiling serenity but there was no trace of mournful recollection in that bright beaming face which was turned in all graciousness towards the baron who sat caressing leo's curls while the boy wriggled his plump shoulders half out of his black velvet frock in palpable disgust at the caress oh it will be too lovely too utterly ooptish exclaimed dopsy who had lately acquired this last flower of speech a word which might be made to mean almost anything from the motive power which impels a billiard cue to the money that pays the player's losses at pool a word which is a substantive or adjective according to the speaker's pleasure i suppose we shall be allowed to join you said mopsy we are splendid walkers of course entry open to all weights and ages with mrs tregonell's permission let it be your picnic baron since it is your idea said christabel my housekeeper shall take your orders about the luncheon and we will all consider ourselves your guests i shall expire if i am left out in the cold said mrs torrington you really must allow age the privilege of a pony carriage that delightful cob of mrs tregonell's understands me perfectly well on second thoughts you shall have the carriage said de cazalet graciously the provisions can't walk it shall be your privilege to bring them we will have no servants mr faddy mr fitzjesse and i will do all the fetching and carrying cork drawing and salad making End of chapter eight chapter nine of mount royal volume three by mary elizabeth braden this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nine thou shouldst come like a fury crowned with snakes when the shooting party came home to afternoon tea dopsy and mopsy were both full of the picnic the sun was sinking in lurid splendour there was every chance of a fine day to-morrow 
de cazalet had interviewed the housekeeper and ordered luncheon mopsy went about among the men like a recruiting sergeant telling them of the picnic and begging them to join in that festivity it will be wretched for dopsy and i her grammar was weak and she had a fixed idea that i was a genteeler pronoun than me if you don't all come she said to colonel blathwaite of course the baron will devote himself exclusively to mrs tregonell fitz jessie will go in the pony trap with mrs torrington and they'll have vivisected everybody they know before they get there and i can't get on a little bit with mr faddie though he is awfully nice i feel that if i were to let him talk to me an hour at a stretch i should be obliged to go and join some protestant sisterhood and wear thick boots and two fearful bonnets for the rest of my days and what would society do without mopsy vandeleur asked the colonel smiling at her i should enjoy a ramble with you above all things but a picnic is such a confoundedly infantine business i always feel a hundred years old when i attempt to be gay and frisky before dusk feel as if i have been dead and come back to life again as some of the savage tribes believe however if it will really please you i'll give up the birds to-morrow and join your sports how sweet of you exclaimed mopsy with a thrilling look from under her painted lashes the whole thing would be ghastly without you what's the row asked leonard turning his head upon the cushion of the easy-chair in which he lolled at full length to look up at the speakers as they stood a little away behind him the master of mount royal was sitting by one fireplace with a table and tea-tray all to himself while mrs tregonell and her circle were grouped about the hearth at the opposite end of the hall jack vandeleur and little monty stood in front of the fire near their host faithful adherence to the friend who fed them but all the rest of the party clustered round christabel mopsy told mr tregonell all about the intended picnic it is to be the baron's affair she said gaily he organized it and he is to play the host there are to be no carriages except the pony trap for mrs torrington who pinches her feet and her waist to a degree that makes locomotion impossible we are all to walk except her and i believe we are to have tea at the farm by st piran's well a simple farmhouse tea in some dear old whitewashed room with a huge fireplace hams and onions and things hanging from the rafters isn't it a lovely idea very grumbled leonard but i should say you could have your tea a great deal more comfortably here without being under any obligation to the farm people oh but we have our tea here every afternoon said mopsy think of the novelty of the thing no doubt and this picnic is the baron's idea his and mrs tregonell's they planned it all between them and they are going to get up private theatricals for your birthday how kind growled leonard scowling at his teacup isn't it sweet of them they are going to play delicate ground he is to be citizen sans froid and she pauline the husband and wife who quarrel and pretend to separate and are desperately fond of each other all the time don't you know it's a powder piece a what a play in which people wear powdered wigs and patches and all that kind of thing how dense you are i was born so i believe and in this powder piece mrs tregonell and baron de cazalet are to be husband and wife and quarrel and make friends again eh yes the reconciliation is awfully fetching but you are not jealous are you jealous not the least bit that's so nice of you and you will come to our picnic to-morrow i think not why not because the woodcock season is a short one and i want to make the best use of my time what a barbarian to prefer any sport to our society exclaimed mopsy coquettishly for my part i hate the very name of woodcock why asked leonard looking at her keenly with his dark bright eyes eyes which had that hard glassy brightness that has always a cruel look because it reminds me of that dreadful day last year when poor mr hamley was killed if he had not gone out woodcock shooting he would not have been killed no a man's death generally hinges upon something answered leonard with a chilling sneer no effect without a cause but i don't think you need waste your lamentations upon mr hamley he did not treat your sister particularly well mopsy sighed and was thoughtful for a moment or two captain vandeleur and mr montague had strolled off to change their clothes the master of the house and miss vandeleur were alone at their end of the old hall ripples of silvery laughter and the sound of mirthful voices came from the group about the other fireplace 
where the blaze of piled-up logs went roaring up the wide windy chimney making the most magical changeful light in which beauty or its opposite can be seen no he hardly acted fairly to poor dopsy he led her on don't you know and we both thought he meant to propose it would have been such a splendid match for her and i could have stayed with them sometimes of course you could sometimes in your case would have meant all the year round and he was so fascinating so handsome ill as he looked poor darling sighed mopsy i know dop hadn't one mercenary feeling about him it was a genuine case of spoons she would have died for him if he had wished it but men have not yet gone in for collecting corpses sneered leonard however poor the specimen of your sex may be they prefer the living subject even the surgeons are all coming round to that don't be nasty protested mopsy i only meant to say that dopsy really adored angus hamley for his own sake i know how kindly you felt upon the subject and that you wanted it to be a match yes i did my best answered leonard i brought him here and gave you both your chance and jack said that you spoke very sharply to mr hamley that last night yes i gave him a piece of my mind i told him that he had no right to come into my house and play fast and loose with my friend's sister how did he take it pretty quietly you did not quarrel with him no it could hardly be called a quarrel we were both too reasonable understood each other too thoroughly answered leonard as he got up and went off to his dressing-room leaving mopsy sorely perplexed by an indescribable something in his tone and manner surely there must be some fatal meaning in that dark evil smile which changed to so black a frown and that deep sigh which seemed wrung from the very heart of the man a man whom mopsy had hitherto believed to be somewhat poorly furnished with that organ taken in its poetical significance as a thing that throbs with love and pity alone in his dressing-room the lord of the manor sat down in front of the fire with his boots on the hob to muse upon the incongruity of his present position in his own house a year ago he had ruled supreme sovereign master of the domestic circle obeyed and ministered to in all humility by a lovely and pure-minded wife now he was a cipher in his own house the husband of a woman who was almost as strange to him as if he had seen her face for the first time on his return from south america this beautiful brilliant creature who held him at arm's length defied him openly with looks and tones in which his guilty soul recognized a terrible meaning looks and tones which he dare not challenge this woman who lived only for pleasure fine dress frivolity who had given his house the free and easy air of a mess-room or a club could this be indeed the woman he had loved in her girlhood the fair and simple-minded wife whom his mother had trained for him teaching her all good things withholding all knowledge of evil i'm not going to stand it much longer he said to himself with an oath as he kicked the logs about upon his fire and then got up to dress for the feast at which he always felt himself just the one guest who was not wanted he had been at home three weeks it seemed an age an age of disillusion and discontent and he had not yet sought any explanation with christabel not yet had he dared to claim his right to be obeyed as a husband to be treated as a friend and adviser with a strange reluctance he put off the explanation from day to day and in the meanwhile the aspect of life at mount royal was growing daily less agreeable to him could it be that this wife of his whose purity and faith he had tried by the hardest test the test of daily companionship with her first and only lover was inclined to waver now to play him false for so shallow a coxcomb so tawdry a fine gentleman as oliver de cazalet not once but many times within the past week he had asked himself that question could it be he had heard strange stories had known of queer cases of the falling away of good women from the path of virtue he had heard of sober matrons mothers of fair children wives of many years the cornelias of their circle staking home husband children honour good name and troops of friends against the wild delirium of some new-born fancy sudden demoniac as the dance of death the women who go wrong are not always the most likely women it is not the trampled slave the neglected and forlorn wife of a bad husband but the pearl and treasure of a happy circle who takes the fatal plunge into the mire the forlorn slave wife stays in the dreary home and nurses her children battles with her husband's creditors consoles herself with church-going and many prayers 
fondly hoping for a future day in which tom will find out that she is fairer and dearer than any of his false goddesses and come home repentant to the domestic hearth while the good husband's idol sated with legitimate worship gives herself up all at once to the intoxication of unholy incense and topples off her shrine leonard tregonell knew that the world was full of such psychological mysteries and yet he could hardly bring himself to believe that christabel was of the stuff that makes false wives or that she could be won by such a third-rate don juan as the baron de cazalet the dinner was a little noisier and gayer than usual to-night every one talked laughed told anecdotes let off puns more or less atrocious except the host who sat in his place an image of gloom happily mrs st aubyn was one of those stout healthy contented people who enjoy their dinner and only talk about as much as is required for the assistance of digestion she told prosy stories about her pigs and poultry which were altogether superior intellectually and physically to other people's pigs and poultry and only paused once or twice to exclaim you are looking awfully tired mr tregonell you must have overdone it to-day don't you take curacoa i always do after ice pudding it's so comforting do you know at the last dinner i was at before i came here the curacoa was ginger brandy wasn't that horrid people ought not to do such things leonard suggested in a bored voice that this might have been the butler's mistake i don't think so i believe it was actual meanness but i shall never take liqueur at that house again said mrs st aubyn in an injured tone are you going to this picnic to-morrow i think not i'm afraid the walk will be too much for me and i'm not fond of mrs torrington to enjoy two hours tete-a-tete in a pony carriage my girls will go of course and i suppose you will be there added mrs st aubyn with intention no vandeleur monty and i are going shooting well if i were in your shoes and had such a pretty wife i should not leave her to go picnicking about the world with such an attractive man as the baron leonard gave an uneasy little laugh meant to convey the idea of supreme security i'm not jealous of de cazalet he said surely you don't call him an attractive man dangerously attractive replied mrs st aubyn gazing at the distant baron whose florid good looks were asserting themselves at the further end of the table on christabel's left hand she had mr st aubyn's grey contented face glistening with dinner on her right he is just the kind of man i should have fallen in love with when i was your wife's age really exclaimed leonard incredulously but i suppose after you married st aubyn you left off falling in love of course i did not put myself in the way of temptation i should never have encouraged such a man handsome accomplished unscrupulous as baron de cazalet i don't think his good looks or his unscrupulousness will make any difference to my wife said leonard she knows how to take care of herself no doubt but that does not release you from the duty of taking care you had better go to the picnic my dear mrs st aubyn if i were to go now after what you have just said to me you might suppose i was jealous of de cazalet and that is just the one supposition i could not stand answered leonard it would take a dozen such fascinating men to shake my confidence in my wife she is not an acquaintance of yesterday remember i have known her all my life mrs st aubyn sighed and shook her head she was one of those stupid well-meaning women whose mission in life is to make other people uncomfortable with the best intentions she kept a steady lookout for the approaching misfortunes of her friends she was the first to tell an anxious mother that her youngest son was sickening for scarlet fever or that her eldest girl looked consumptive she prophesied rheumatics and bronchitis to incautious people who went out in wet weather she held it as a fixed belief that all her friends houses were damp it was in vain that vexed householders protested against such a suspicion and held forth upon the superiority of their drainage the felt under their tiles their air bricks and ventilators my dear your house is damp she would reply conclusively what it would be if you had not taken those precautions i shudder to imagine but i only know that i get the shivers every time i sit in your drawing-room to-night she was somewhat offended with mr tregonell that he refused to take alarm at her friendly warning she had made up her mind that it was her duty to speak she had told the girls so in the course of their afternoon constitutional a private family walk if things get any worse i shall take you away 
she said as they trudged along the lane in their waterproofs caring very little for a soft drizzling rain which was supposed to be good for their complexions don't mother said emily clare and i are having such a jolly time mrs tregonell is straight enough i'm sure she does flirt outrageously with the baron i admit but an open flirtation of that kind seldom means mischief and mr tregonell is such a heavy clod hopping fellow his wife may be forgiven for flirting a little mrs tregonell flirts more than a little replied mrs st aubyn all i can say is i don't like it and i don't think it's a proper spectacle for girls then you'd better send us back to the nursery mother or shut us up in a convent retorted the younger of the damsels if you don't want us to see young married women flirt you must keep us very close indeed if you feel uneasy about your coach and china's mother you can go home and leave us to follow with the pater said emily i've set my heart upon stopping till after mr tregonell's birthday the fourteenth of november for the theatricals will be fine fun they talk of high life below stairs for us girls after delicate ground and i think we shall be able to persuade mrs tregonell to wind up with a dance what is the use of people having fine rooms if they don't know how to use them mrs tregonell seems ready for anything sighed the matron i never saw such a change in any one do you remember how quiet she was the summer before last when we were here for a few days End of chapter nine Chapter Ten of Mount Royal, Volume Three by Mary Elizabeth Braden. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Ten. His lady smiles. Delight is in her face. That benevolent advice of Mrs. Saint Aubyn's was not without its influence upon Leonard, lightly as he seemed to put aside the insinuation of evil. The matron's speech helped to strengthen his own doubts and fears. Other eyes than his had noted Christabel's manner of receiving the Baron's attentions other people had been impressed by the change in her the thing was not an evil of his own imagining she was making herself the talk of his friends and acquaintance there was scandal foul suspicion in the very atmosphere she breathed that mutual understanding that face-to-face -face arraignment which he felt must come sooner or later could not be staved off much longer the wife who defied him thus openly making light of him under his own roof must be brought to book to-morrow she and i must come to terms leonard said to himself no one had much leisure for thought that evening the drawing-room was a scene of babble and laughter music flirtation frivolity everybody seeming to be blessed with that happy-go-lucky temperament which can extract mirth from the merest trifles jessie bridgman and mr tregonell were the only lookers-on the only two people who in jack vandeleur's favourite phrase were not in it every one else was full of the private theatricals the idea had only been mooted after luncheon and now it seemed as if life could hardly have been bearable yesterday without this thrilling prospect colonel blathwaite who had been out shooting all the afternoon entered vigorously into the discussion he was an experienced amateur actor had helped to swell the funds of half the charitable institutions of london and the provinces so he at once assumed the function of stage manager de cazalet can act he said i have seen him at south kensington but i don't think he knows the ropes as well as i do you must let me manage the whole business for you write to the london people for stage and scenery lamps costumes wigs and of course you will want me for alphonse little monty had been suggested for alphonse he was fair-haired and effeminate and had just that small namby-pamby air which would suit pauline's faint-hearted lover but nobody dared to say anything about him when colonel blathwaite made his generous offer will you really play alphonse exclaimed christabel looking up from the volume of engravings illustrating the costumes of the directory and empire over which the young ladies of the party notably dopsy and mopsy had been giggling and ejaculating we should not have ventured to offer you a secondary part you'll find it won't be a secondary character as i shall play it answered the colonel calmly alphonse will go better than any part in the piece and now as to the costumes do you want to be picturesque or do you want to be correct picturesque by all means cried mopsy dear mrs tregonell would look too lovely in powder and patches like boucher's pompadour said the colonel do you know i think now fancy balls are the rage the louis quinze costume is rather played out every ponderous matron fancies herself in powder and brocade 
the powder is hired for the evening and the brocade is easily convertible into a dinner gown added the colonel who spent the greater part of his life among women and prided himself upon knowing their ways for my part i should like to see mrs tregonell dressed like madame tallien undressed like madame tallien you mean said captain vandeleur and thereupon followed a lively discussion as to the costume of the close of the last century as compared with the costume of to-day which ended in somebody's assertion that the last years of a century are apt to expire in social and political convulsions and that there was every promise of revolution as a wind-up for the present age my idea of the close of the nineteenth century is that it will be a period of dire poverty said the proprietor of the sling an age of pauperism already heralded by the sale of noble old mansions the breaking up of great estates the destruction of famous collections galleries libraries the pious hordes of generations of connoisseurs and bookworms scattered to the four winds by a stroke of the auctioneer's hammer the landed interest and the commercial classes are going down the hill together suez has ruined our shipping interests an unreciprocated free trade is ruining our commerce coffee tea cotton our markets are narrowing for all after a period of lavish expenditure reckless extravagance or at any rate the affectation of reckless extravagance there will come an era of dearth those are the wisest who will foresee and anticipate the change simplify their habits reduce their luxuries put on a quakerish sobriety in dress and entertainments which if carried out nicely may pass for high art train themselves to a kind of holy poverty outside the cloister and thus break their fall depend upon it there will be a fall for every one of those men and women who at this present day are living up to their incomes the voice is the voice of fitz jesse but the words are the words of cassandra said colonel blathwaite for my part i am like the greeks and never listen to such gloomy vaticinations i dare say the deluge will come a deluge now and again is inevitable but i think the dry land will last our time and in the meanwhile was there ever a pleasanter world than that we live in an entirely rebuilt and revivified london clubs theatres restaurants without number gaiety and brightness everywhere if our amusements are frivolous at least they are hearty if our friendships are transient they are very pleasant while they last we know people to-day and cut them to-morrow that is one of the first conditions of good society the people who are cut understand the force of circumstances and are just as ready to take up the running a year or two hence when we can afford to know them blessed are the poor in spirit quoted little monty in a meek voice our women are getting every day more like the women of the directory and the consulate continued the colonel we have come to short petticoats and gold anklets all in good time we shall come to bare feet we have abolished sleeves and we have brought bodices to a reductio ad absurdum but although prudes and puritans may disapprove our present form i must say that women were never so intelligent or so delightful we have come back to the days of the salon and the petit souper our daughters are sirens and our wives are wits charming for colonel blathwaite whose only experience is of the other people's wives and daughters said little monty but i don't feel sure that the owners are quite so happy when a man marries a pretty woman he puts himself beyond the pale said mr fitz jesse nobody sympathizes with him i dare say there was not a member of the grecian league who did not long to kick menelaus there should be stringent laws for the repression of nice girls fathers said little monty could there not be some kind of institution like the irish land court to force parents to cash up and hand over daughter and dowry to any spirited young man who made a bid here am i a conspicuous martyr to parental despotism i might have married half a dozen heiresses but for the intervention of stony-hearted fathers i have gone for them at all ages from pinafores to false fronts but i have never been so lucky as to rise an orphan poor little monty but what a happy escape for the lady ah i should have been very kind to her even if her youth and beauty dated before the reform bill said mr montague i should not have gone into society with her one must draw the line somewhere but i should have been forbearing dear mrs tregonell said mopsy gushingly have you made up your mind what to wear christabel had been turning the leaves of a folio abstractedly for the last ten minutes to wear oh for the play 
well i suppose i must be as true to the period as i can without imitating madame tallien baron you draw beautifully will you make a sketch for my costume i know a little woman in george street hanover square who will carry out your idea charmingly i should have thought that you could have imagined a short-waisted gown and a pair of long mittens without the help of an artist said jessie with some acidity she had been sitting close to the lamp poring over a piece of point-lace work a quiet and observant listener it was a fixed idea among the servants at mount royal that miss bridgman's eyes were constructed on the same principle as those of a horse and that she could see behind her there is nothing so very elaborate in the dress of that period is there i will try to realize the poetry of the costume oh but the poetry means the bare feet and ankles doesn't it asked miss bridgman when you talk about poetry and costume you generally mean something that sets a whole roomful of people staring and tittering my pauline will look a sylph said the baron with a languishing glance at his hostess and thus in the pursuit of the infinitely little the evening wore away songs and laughter music of the lightest and most evanescent character games which touched the confines of idiocy and set leonard wondering whether the evening amusement of colney hatch and hanwell could possibly savour of wilder lunacy than these sports which his wife and her circle cultivated in the grave old reception-room where a council of cavaliers with george trevelyan of nettlecombe a royalist colonel at their head had met and sworn fealty to charles stuart's cause at hazard of fortune and life leonard stood with his back to the wide old fireplace watching these revellers and speculating in a troubled spirit as to how much of this juvenile friskiness was real contemplating with a cynical spirit that nice sense of class distinction which enabled the two st aubin girls to keep mopsy and dopsy at an impassable distance even while engaged with them in these familiar sports vain that in the post-office game dopsy as montreal exchanged places with emily st aubin as newmarket montreal and newmarket themselves are not farther apart geographically than the two damsels were morally as they skipped into each other's chairs vain that in the spelling game the south belgravians caught up the landowner's daughters with a surprising sharpness and sometimes turned the laugh against those tender scions of the landed aristocracy the very attitude of clara st aubin's chin the way she talked apart with mrs tregonell seemingly unconscious of the vandeleur presence marked her inward sense of the gulf between them it was midnight before any one thought of going to bed yet there was unwanted animation at nine o'clock next morning in the dining-room where every one was talking of the day's expedition always excepting the master of the house who sat at one end of the table with termagant his favourite irish setter crouched at his feet and his game-bag lying on a chair near at hand are you really going to desert us asked mopsy with her sweetest smile i am not going to desert you for i never had the faintest intention of joining you answered leonard bluntly whether my wife and her friends made idiots of themselves by playing nursery games in the drawing-room or by skipping about a windy height on the edge of the sea is their own affair i can take my pleasure elsewhere yes but you take your pleasure very sadly as somebody said of english people generally urged mopsy whose only knowledge of polite literature was derived from the classical quotations and allusions in the daily telegraph you will be all alone for jack and little monty have promised to come with us i gave them perfect freedom of choice they may like that kind of thing i don't against so firm a resolve argument would have been in vain mopsy gave a little sigh and went on with her breakfast she was really sorry for leonard who had been a kind and useful friend to jack for the last six years who had been indeed the backbone of jack's resources without which that gentleman's pecuniary position would have collapsed into hopeless limpness she was quite sharp-sighted enough to see that the present aspect of affairs was obnoxious to mr tregonell that he was savagely jealous yet dared not remonstrate with his wife i should have thought he was just the last man to put up with anything of that kind she said to dopsy in their bedchamber confidences i mean her carrying on with the baron you needn't explain yourself retorted dopsy it's visible to the naked eye if you or i were to carry on like that in another woman's house we should get turned out but mrs tregonell is in her own house and so long as her husband doesn't see fit to complain but when will he see fit he stands by and watches his wife's open flirtation with the baron and lets her go on from bad to worse he must see that her very nature is changed since last year and yet he makes no attempt to alter her conduct he is an absolute worm 
even the worm will turn at last you may depend he will said dopsy sententiously this was last night's conversation and now in the bright fresh october morning with a delicious coolness in the clear air a balmy warmth in the sunshine dopsy and mopsy were smiling at their hostess for whose kindness they could not help feeling deeply grateful whatever they might think of her conduct they recognized a divided duty loyalty to leonard as their brother's patron and the friend who had first introduced them to this land of beulah gratitude to mrs tregonell without whose good graces they could not long have made their abode here you are not going with us asked christabel carelessly scanning leonard's shooting-gear as she rose from the table and drew on her long mousquetaire gloves no i'm going to shoot shall you go to the kiev that's a good place for woodcock don't you know jessie bridgman stared aghast at the speaker if you go that way in the afternoon you may fall in with us we are to drink tea at the farm perhaps i may go that way and now if every one is ready we had better start said christabel looking around at her party she wore a tight-fitting jacket dark olive velvet and a cloth skirt both heavily trimmed with sable a beaver hat with an ostrich feather which made a sweeping curve round the brim and caressed a coil of golden-brown hair at the back of the small head the costume which was faintly suggestive of a hunting party at fontainebleau or st germain became the tall finely moulded figure to admiration nobody could doubt for an instant that mrs tregonell was dressed for effect and was determined to get full value out of her beauty the neat tailor gown and simple little cloth toque of the past had given way to a costly and elaborate costume in which every detail marked the careful study of the coquette who lives only to be admired dopsy and mopsy felt a natural pang of envy as they scrutinized the quality of the cloth and calculated the cost of the fur but they consoled themselves with the conviction that there was a bewitching kate greenaway quaintness in their own flimsy garments which made up for the poverty of the stuff and the doubtful finish of home dressmaking a bunch of crimson poppies on mopsy's shoulder a cornflower in dopsy's hat made vivid gleams of colour upon their brown merino frocks while the freshness of their saffron tinted toby frills was undeniable sleeves short and tight and ten buttoned swedish gloves made up a toilette which dopsy and mopsy had believed to be aesthetically perfect until they compared it with christabel's rich and picturesque attire the st aubin girls were not less conscious of the superiority of mrs tregonell's appearance but they were resigned to the inevitable how could a meagre quarterly allowance doled out by an unwilling father stand against a wife's unlimited power of running up bills and here was a woman who had a fortune of her own to squander as she pleased without anybody's leave or license secure in the severity of slate-coloured serges made by a west end tailor with hats to match and the best boots and gloves that money could buy the st aubin girls affected to despise christabel's olive velvet and sable tails it's the worst possible form to dress like that for a country ramble murmured emily to clara of course but the country's about the only place where she could venture to wear such clothes replied clara she'd be laughed at in london well i don't know there were some rather loud get-ups in the park last season said emily it's really absurd the way married women outdress girls once clear of the avenue mrs tregonell and her guests arranged themselves upon the darwinian principle of natural selection that brilliant bird the baron whose velvet coat and knickerbockers were the astonishment of beaucastle instinctively drew near to christabel whose velvet and sable plumed hat and point lace necktie pointed her out as his proper mate little monty bohemian and decousu attached himself as naturally to one of the vandeleur girls shunning the iron-grey respectability of the st aubin breed mrs st aubin who had made up her mind at the last to join the party fastened herself upon st bernard faddy in the fond hope that he would be able to talk of parish matters and advise her about her duties as lady bountiful while he on his part only cared for rubric and ritual and looked upon parish visitation as an inferior branch of duty to be performed by newly pledged curates mr fitzjesse took up with dopsy who amused him as a marked specimen of nineteenth-century girlhood a rare and wonderful bird of its kind like a heavily waddled barb pigeon not beautiful but infinitely curious the two st aubin girls in a paucity of the male sex had to put up with the escort of captain vandeleur to whom they were extremely civil although they studiously ignored his sisters and so by lane and field path by hill and vale they went up to the broad open heights above the sea a sea that was very fair to look upon on this sunshiny autumn day 
luminous with those translucent hues of amethyst and emerald sapphire and garnet which make the ever changeful glory of that cornish strand miss bridgman walked half the way with the st aubyn girls and captain vandeleur the st aubyns had always been civil to her not without a certain tone of patronage which would have wounded a more self-conscious person but which jessie endured with perfect good temper what does it matter if they have the air of bending down from a higher social level every time they talk to me she said to major brie lightly when he made some rude remark about these young ladies if it pleases them to fancy themselves on a pinnacle the fancy is a harmless one and can't hurt me i shouldn't care to occupy that kind of imaginary height myself there must be a disagreeable sense of chilliness and remoteness and then there is always the fear of a sudden drop like that fall through infinite space which startles one sometimes on the edge of sleep armed with that calm philosophy which takes all small things lightly jessie was quite content that the miss st aubyns should converse with her as if she were a creature of an inferior race born with lesser hopes and narrower needs than theirs and with no rights worth mention she was content that they should be sometimes familiar and sometimes distant that they should talk to her freely when there was no one else with whom they could talk and that they should ignore her presence when the room was full to-day emily st aubyn was complacent even to friendliness her sister had completely appropriated captain vandeleur so emily gave herself up to feminine gossip there were some subjects which she really wanted to discuss with miss bridgman and this seemed a golden opportunity are we really going to have tea at the farmhouse near st nectan's kiev she asked didn't you hear mrs tregonell say so inquired jessie dryly i did but i could not help wondering a little was it not at the kiev that poor mr hamley was killed yes don't you think it just a little heartless of mrs tregonell to choose that spot for a pleasure party the farmhouse is not the kiev they are at least a mile apart that's a mere quibble miss bridgman the association is just the same and she ought to feel it mrs tregonell is my very dear friend answered jessie she and her aunt are the only friends i have made in this world you can't suppose that i shall find fault with her conduct no i suppose not you would stand by her through thick and thin through thick and thin even at the sacrifice of principle i should consider gratitude and friendship the governing principles of my life where she is concerned if she were to go ever so wrong you would still stand by her stand by her and cleave to her walk by her side till death wherever the path might lead i should not encourage her in wrong-doing i should lift up my voice when there was need but i should never forsake her that is your idea of friendship unquestionably to my mind friendship which implies anything less than that is meaningless however there is no need for heroics mrs tregonell is not going to put me to the test i hope not she is very sweet i should be deeply pained if she were to go wrong but do you know that my mother does not at all like her manner with the baron my sister and i are much more liberal-minded don't you know and we can understand that all she says and does is mere frivolity high spirits which must find some outlet but what surprises me is that she should be so gay and light-hearted after the dreadful events of her life if such things had happened to me i should inevitably have gone over to rome and buried myself in the severest conventual order that i could find yes there have been sad events in her life but i think she chose the wiser course in doing her duty by the aunt who brought her up than in self-immolation of that kind answered jessie with her thin lips drawn to the firmest line they were capable of assuming but think what she must have suffered last year when that poor man was killed i remember meeting him at dinner when they were first engaged such an interesting face the countenance of a poet i could fancy shelley or keats exactly like him we have their portraits said jessie intolerant of gush there is no scope for fancy but i think he really was a little like keats consumptive looking too which carried out the idea how utterly dreadful it must have been for mrs tregonell when he met his death so suddenly so awfully while he was a guest under her roof how did she bear it very quietly she had borne the pain of breaking her engagement for a principle a mistaken one as i think his death could hardly have given her worse pain but it was such an awful death awful in its suddenness that is all not more awful than the death of any one of our english soldiers who fell in zululand the other day after all the mode and manner of death is only a detail 
and so long as the physical pain is not severe an insignificant detail the one stupendous fact for the survivor remains always the same we had a friend and he is gone for ever for all we know there was the faint sound of a sob in her voice as she finished speaking well all i can say is that if i were mrs tregonell i could never have been happy again persisted miss st aubyn they came to trevena soon after this and went down the hill to the base of that lofty crag on which king arthur's castle stood they found mrs fairfax and the pony carriage in the valley the provisions had all been carried up the ascent everything was ready for luncheon a quarter of an hour later they were all seated on the long grass and the crumbling stones on which christabel and her lover had sat so often in that happy season of her life when love was a new thought and faith in the beloved one as boundless as that far-reaching ocean on which they gazed in dreamy content now instead of low talk about arthur and guinevere tristan and isoult and all the legends of the dim poetic past there were loud voices and laughter execrable puns much conversation of the order generally known as chaff a great deal of mild personality of that kind which in the age of miss burney and miss austin was described as quizzing and roasting and an all-pervading flavour of lunacy the baron de cazalet tried to take advantage of the position and rise to poetry but he was lapped down by the majority especially by mr fitzjesse who hadn't a good word for arthur and his court mark was a coward and tristan was a traitor and a knave he said while as for isoult the less said of her the better the legends of arthur's birth are cleverly contrived to rehabilitate his mother's character but the lady's reputation still is open to doubt jack the giant killer and tom thumb are quite the most respectable heroes connected with this western world you have no occasion to be proud of the associations of the soil mrs tregonell but i am proud of my country and of its legends answered christabel and you believe in tristan and isoult and the constancy which was personified by a bramble as in the famous ballad of lord lovell the constancy which proved itself by marrying somebody else and remaining true to the old love all the same said mrs fairfax torrington in her society voice trained to detonate sharp sentences across a subdued buzz of a dinner-table poor tristan sighed dopsy poor isoult murmured mopsy they had never heard of either personage until this morning nothing in the life of either became them so well as the leaving it said mr fitzjesse the crowning touch of poetry in isoult's death redeems her errors you remember how she was led half senseless to tristan's death chamber quote la l'embrasse de ses bras tant comme elle peut et jette son soupir et se passe me sur le corps et le coeur lui part et l'âme s'en va End quote if every woman who loses her lover could die like that said jessie with a curious glance at christabel who sat listening smilingly to the conversation with the baron prostrate at her feet instead of making good her loss at the earliest opportunity what a dreary place this world would be murmured little monty i think somebody in the poetic line has observed that nothing in nature is constant so it would be hard lines upon women if they were to be fettered for life by some early attachment that came to a bad end look at juliet's constancy said miss st aubyn juliet was never put to the test answered fitzjesse the whole course of her love affair was something less than a week if that potion of hers had failed and she had awakened safe and sound in her own bedchamber next morning who knows that she would not have submitted to the force of circumstances married count paris and lived happily with him ever after there is only one perfect example of constancy in the whole realm of poetry and that is the love of paolo and francesca the love which even the pains of hell could not dissever they weren't married don't you know lisped monty they hadn't had the opportunity of getting tired of each other and then in the underworld a lady would be glad to take up with somebody she had known on earth just as in australia one is delighted to fall in with a fellow one wouldn't care two pence for in bond street i believe you are right said mr fitzjesse and that constancy is only another name for convenience married people are constant to each other as a rule because there is such an infernal row when they fall out lightly flew the moments in the balmy air freshened by the salt sea warmed by the glory of a meridian sun lightly and happily for that wise majority of the revellers whose philosophy is to get the most out of today's fair summer time and to leave future winters and possible calamities to jove's discretion jessie watched the girl who had grown up by her side 
whose every thought she had once known and wondered if this beautiful artificial impersonation of society tones and society graces could be verily the same flesh and blood what had made this wondrous transformation had christabel's very soul undergone a change during that dismal period of apathy last winter she had awakened from that catalepsy of despair a new woman eager for frivolous pleasures courting admiration studious of effect the very opposite of that high-souled and pure-minded girl whom jessie had known and loved it is the most awful moral wreck that was ever seen thought jessie but if my love can save her from deeper degradation she shall be saved could she care for that showy impostor posed at her feet gazing up at her with passionate eyes hanging on her accents openly worshipping her she seemed to accept his idolatry to sanction his insolence and all her friends looked on half scornful half amused what can tregonell be thinking about not to be here to-day said jack vandeleur close to jessie's elbow why should he be here she asked because he's wanted he's neglecting that silly woman shamefully it is only his way answered jessie scornfully last year he invited mr hamley to mount royal who had been engaged to his wife a few years before he is not given to jealousy evidently not said captain vandeleur waxing thoughtful as he lighted a cigarette and strolled slowly off to stare at the sea the rocky pinnacles and yonder cormorants skimming away from a sharp point to dip and vanish in the green water the pilgrimage from trevena to trevithy farm was somewhat less straggling than the long walk by the cliffs the way was along a high road which necessitated less meandering but the party still divided itself into twos and threes and christabel still allowed de cazalet the privilege of a tete-a-tete she was a better walker than any of her friends and the baron was a practised pedestrian so those two kept well ahead leaving the rest of the party to follow as they pleased i wonder they are not tired of each other by this time said mopsy whose wurtemberg heels were beginning to tell upon her temper it has been such a long day and such a long walk what can the baron find to talk about all this time himself answered fitzjessie an inexhaustible subject men can always talk listening is the art in which they fail are you a good listener miss vandeleur i am afraid not if any one is prosy i begin to think of my frocks very bad as a young woman with the conquest of society before you i most earnestly recommend you cultivate the listener's art talk just enough to develop your companion's powers if he has a hobby let him ride it be interested be sympathetic do not always agree but differ only to be convinced argue only to be converted never answer at random or stifle a yawn be a perfect listener and society is open to you people will talk of you as the most intelligent girl they know mopsy smiled a sickly smile the agony of those ready-made boots just a quarter of a size too small though they had seemed so comfortable in the shoemaker's shop was increasing momentarily here was a hill like the side of a house to be descended poor mopsy felt as if she were balancing herself on the points of her toes she leant feebly on her umbrella while the editor of the sling trudged sturdily by her side admiring the landscape stopping halfway down the hill to point out the grander features of the scene with his bamboo stopping was ever so much worse than going on it was as if the fires consuming the martyr at the stake had suddenly gone out and left him with an acuter consciousness of his pain too too lovely murmured mopsy heartily wishing herself in the king's road chelsea within hail of an omnibus she hobbled on somehow pretending to listen to mr fitzjessie's conversation but feeling that she was momentarily demonstrating her incompetence as a listener till they came to the farm where she was able to totter into the sitting-room and sink into the nearest chair i'm afraid you're tired said the journalist a sturdy block of a man who hardly knew the meaning of fatigue i am just a little tired she faltered hypocritically but it has been a lovely walk they were the last to arrive the tea-things were ready upon a table covered with snowy damask a substantial tea including home-made loaves saffron-coloured cakes jam marmalade and cream but there was no one in the room except mrs fairfax torrington who had enthroned herself in the most comfortable chair by the side of the cheerful fire all the rest of our people have gone straggling off to look at things she said some to the kiev and as that is a mile off we shall have ever so long to wait for our tea 
do you think we need wait very long asked mopsy whose head was aching from the effects of midday champagne would it be so very bad if we were to ask for a cup of tea i am positively longing for tea said mrs torrington to fitz jesse ignoring mopsy then i'll ask the farm people to brew a special pot for you two answered the journalist ringing the bell here comes mr tregonell game bag dogs and all this is more friendly than i expected leonard strolled across the little quadrangular garden and came in at the low door as mr fitz jesse spoke i thought i should find some of you here he said where are the others gone to the kiev most of them answered mrs torrington briskly her freshness contrasted cruelly with mopsy's limp and exhausted condition at least i know your wife and de cazalet were bent on going there she had promised to show the waterfall we were just debating whether we ought to wait tea for them i wouldn't if i were you said leonard no doubt they'll take their time he flung down his game bag took up his hat whistled to his dogs and went towards the door won't you stop and have some tea just to keep us in countenance asked mrs torrington no thanks i'd rather have it later i'll go and meet the others if he ever intended to look after her it was certainly time he should begin said the widow when the door was shut upon her host please ring again mr fitz jesse how slow these farm people are do they suppose we have come here to stare at cups and saucers End of chapter ten